we have enormous ground to cover in a bit less than uh, 50 minutes. Uh, we want to hear about you, obviously, about Rappler. We want to hear about your take on uh, the challenges faced by journalism in your country, but also in this uh, new uh, landscape. And if we have time, it will be uh, fantastic to hear about the Philippines that just went through this uh, midterm uh, election. So shall we start with an update of your own legal situation? So, great. First, I'm so sorry that I was late in setting up, but um, we're live in the Philippines as well. So, <laughs> um, I, oh gosh, where do I begin? Uh, uh, there have been 11 cases filed in 14 months against Rappler. Uh, these are investigations that began uh, a week after President Duterte said Rappler was uh, American-owned, which it's not. Um, unless he considers I'm a dual citizen, you know, so I'll hit it. But 11 cases, so uh, they've all gone to court. Charges that are so ludicrous, I ran out of synonyms for ludicrous for the many times that I've had to talk about it. I've posted bail eight times. I've been arrested twice in five weeks. Um, even though I, you know, I obviously post bail, I come home every time a charge is leveled. I've been arraigned uh, right after election day on Tuesday. M that was Monday. On Tuesday, I was in two courts, and I was arraigned in the morning for cyber libel. This is a case um, where a story we published seven years ago, before the law we supposedly violated was even enacted, um, this case, I've now been charged in court. And then in the afternoon, Tuesday, I was arraigned for another financial thing. They all stem out of one mother case, I call it mother. Um, this is uh, the idea that, and it's the same Putin-esque idea, the idea that um, an investor, a constitutional investment called Philippine Depository Receipts, in this case it's Omidyar Network, our Series A uh, that, we, that I raised, I wanted two strategic investors. I wanted journalists, and that's North Base Media, uh, the man who ran both the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. The guys in Hong Kong may know him, Marcus Broccoli. Uh, that's his, his, um, his VC. And then the other one was Omidyar Network. PDRs are constitutionally regu uh, recognized, um, the largest networks. Uh, there are at least six other major companies that have this. But um, they zoomed in, and I, from there, they filed two different cases. And then after that, they filed tax evasion charges of the same exact, of that same exact 2015 um, movement. And uh, then on top of that, they filed the tax evasion charges, gr had kids. One tax evasion charge became five, and then, and then another financial part of the tax evasion became split into two. It's like a, <laughs> sorry, I can talk about the legal cases yeah, forever. Sure. I will shut up. But <laughs> What, what does it mean for you on a daily basis? I mean, we were very happy to have you. We were not sure you would make it. Um, it means several things. I have to ask permission from courts to travel. Uh, and I know that the FCC, thank you for, for getting me out. It's very different when, you, when I leave, all of a sudden, I, you know, I don't, have to have, I don't have to worry about security. I can walk around. It is so nice. The air is not polluted, even though, you know, it could be polluted mm. outside. Very clean air. Um, and you have your own problems, but uh, it could be worse, you know? Um, so, what is it? Uh, in terms of what my day-to-day, -day, uh, there are times when I can spend four days in court, which means those are days that are taken away from journalism, and they're days taken away from managing my team, which is a super hardworking, very committed team. Yeah, we'll come to that. Um, well, w w what are the main risks for you? Is it jail? Is it enormous debt? I hope not, neither. But let me, uh, the, f the four tax evasion charges each carry 10 years in prison. So collectively, that's 10 years. The anti-dummy, that's what it's called, believe it or not. The, an the violation of the anti-dummy law carries a maximum of 15 years in jail. I mean, technically, I could go to jail for almost a century. But again, that's, that's like worst case scenarios. Yeah. Uh, in terms of what they're trying to do. It's obviously intimidation, harassment. It is meant to take away our resources. 
the good thing is, here's what I did lose. In 2017, I was getting ready to build a new platform. So the money that was supposed to go to that went to the lawyers in 2017. And then we had help. Um, we started a crowdfunding campaign. It's the first in the Philippines, you know. Thank you. And they actually, it, it happened. It's the largest crowdfunding campaign that's ever been done in the Philippines. And then the second thing is, internationally, uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, the Press Freedom Defense Fund, they actually began a legal defense fund. Uh, if you are a Western organization, if you're American, it's a tax-deductible contribution. So thank you. You guys being here, you asking me questions, thank you. Our best defense is to keep telling the story and you shining the light on the Philippines and our descent to tyranny is our only defense. Yeah. It's also, I mean, uh, the FCC cannot do much, but I suppose You've that- You've done a lot. The statements really help. Giving you a stage and uh, yes, and uh, this afternoon actually Maria has got a bigger lineup of uh, interviews as well, so if at least we can contribute by raising uh, further your, uh, your profile, it's, uh, we're very happy to do that. Now, let's talk about uh, Rappler. You started this project 2012. Can you tell us how, before that you were for 20 years with CNN, um, can you tell us how did you suddenly feel the need, the urge, the will to do this? I think I've been really privileged um, to be able to see evolution, the evolution of not just journalism, but our business of journalism, right? So the time I was with CNN, I was a cost center. And I remember, you know, not thinking twice, I can spend $10,000 on a trip. Gosh, now, by the time I was leaving CNN, that, that's not the way it worked anymore. Remember business class? Forget that also, right? Uh, but um, how did it, I think, after I left CNN, I left because I wanted to choose home. For many of you in the room who belong to more than one culture, you give yourself a deadline. My deadline was 40 years old, choose a home, and then when I was doing breaking news for CNN, I always felt like I was telling other people's stories and I lived on adrenaline, but I wasn't building anything. And so I thought I was old enough to have real experience but young enough to still have enough energy to do something so I came home and I headed the largest television um, news multimedia group so for about a thousand people I handled the the kind of commercial television news then we had the first English 24-hour cable news network I had great dreams of making that global uh, abscbnnews.com I did that for six years but the challenge for that is about efficiency, right? If you're managing a huge news group in the past, it was how you make your workflows efficient. The challenge of today is not efficiency. In fact, it's about trying to find the spaces to make your people creative and to give them, to give your organization both the ability to be stable in workflows and yet have the unpredictability that comes out of real creativity. That's a tough combination. So after six years at ABS-CBN, the first year was the most fun part, which was creating systems. But the last six, the sixth year was all about money. It was just a PNL, and not, not happy, not reporting. I wasn't, you know. So I looked at what was going to disrupt us, and this was in 2010. And it's digital. And what did the big news groups do at that time? We put our third string onto digital instead of putting our best minds onto it. So I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not happy. Uh, I, d I can't go back and be a reporter because I want to build something. And it turned out in 2010, in the 2010 first automated elections in the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, Benigno Aquino had just won. I wrote a piece for the well, who is it for? Wall, the Wall Street Journal uh, lambasting his, his, uh, his response to a crisis, the Hong Kong bus crisis. You guys would remember this, right? Uh, and I realized I didn't want to play the politics. What I wanted to do was to try to play with the technology. Mm -hmm. So that was when the idea of Rappler was born. Um, and what made us different is my, a lot of my management team from ABS came with me. 
So the woman who managed the 24-hour English cable station, she's now our managing editor. The woman who ran all the newscasts and created newscasts for ABS-CBN, she now runs multimedia. The woman who ran abscbnnews.com, she's now our head of research. And, you know, so it was this Anyone weird thing. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, we're friendly. <laughs> we're friendly. But, you know, obviously quite competitive. And what happened is, I don't think it's possible. Like, I was making too much money to be able to do a startup. And to get that many people, I think this is why there were four or five of us above 40. And we decided we would just take a risk a year. And I cut my pay by like a thousand percent. I mean, you, you know, you just go. And we all took massive pay cuts and we said, let's, what do we lose in a year? And then we hired the smartest 20 somethings we could find. They didn't, in fact, they, most weren't journalists. I hired three people from Twitter because I had just watched their feeds on Twitter and saw their values. Yeah. And we started Rappler with 12 people. In a year and a half, it grew to 75, and we went from zero to the third top online news site in the Philippines. It was incredible. It was yeah, I was go uh, we're going to talk about your team because it's very, uh, it's very important uh, to, uh, to your whole uh, work. Can you tell us where does this unique name come from? <laughs> we had a big battle. And the battle was between the traditional folks, because I'm traditional still in many ways, and, and then our young kids. And uh, they're not kids. Please, I'm sorry if I offended <laughs> you. Um, our younger ones, <laughs> our younger journalists, um, they wanted to make up a name, right? Because they were like, you know, it should be something completely new. It should be, you know, you can even take something like Google. Like, this is the ambition. Google, <laughs> right? Make up a name. So Rappler came from um, a fusion of old and new. If you grew up in the US in the 80s, rap means to talk, right? Rap, we're gonna rap. No one says it anymore. You're very dated if you use that. And then um, I originally wanted to call it Ripple, Ripple. And one of my co-founders who's Filipino said, Maria, this is the Philippines. If you name it Ripple, people will call it Nipple. Uh, and then someone else said, you know, but this is going to be a climb. So it was about repelling. Repel. Uh, so that's where Rappler was born. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, so about the people you work uh, with and you've uh, attracted, you, you just said a few things. Yesterday you showed us um, very uh, impressive images of one of your young staff surrounded without her knowledge by a police uh, policeman. Uh, it is something to work uh, for a uh, rappler. Um, how do you keep them? How do you motivate them despite the risk and the dangers or the intimidation? I'm going to go back to that Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times, right? Crisis and opportunity. You know this. And I think what's happened with the, with the we're built uh, the pressure uh, has made us stronger. So we're a news group that has lost a lot of the friction of a normal news group. Uh, our reporters, look, the idea always was that if I could, if, if the managers can give you the strategic direction, all the decisions should be done at the lowest possible level. It should be bottom up, right? And so everyone in Rappler knows how much we make. We actually give them updates on how we spend the money. We, l we look at, it's very transparent internally, and because of the government attacks, our reporters have taken the lead in, in terms of like, this incredible courage because to them, the attacks represented a test for what our mission really is. And the way the older folks reacted gave them the direction but they give body to it every day, every second. You saw the photos. I don't know if you saw this, but the woman, she's a very slight petite. She, we hired her when she was just like shortly out of, out of school. She's still 25, 26, I think. She faced off with President Duterte. And this is a strange relationship because during the campaigns, uh, we were actually one of the ones that helped humanize him our TV background, mix of TV and print for us, right? And sh when she fell in a ditch, 
during the campaigns, Mayor Duterte got out of his car and picked her up and brought her to the hospital. And when he banned her from the palace, mm, you know, yeah. they, they really had a difficult time putting it in a word, in a phrases that you would understand in a transparent democracy. And the way he phrased it is it's, it's like she betrayed him. You know, he treats her like his granddaughter sí. and she betrayed she him. And yeah, she was just a professional journalist yeah. asking questions. So I think, you know, the difference with us is we'll ask the questions with a smile, but we will ask the questions. That's what we have to do, right? And you mentioned yesterday as well that uh, you've been put on this list of people willing to house the president? What, what does it mean and what are the consequences for you and for your people? No, this is absolutely ridiculous. So I'll start with ridiculous and farce, but there was a list of news organizations, journalists, activists, and lawyers that was released by the palace, and it's always a three-prong. This is the tactics, and I don't know if you have something similar here in Hong Kong. Strafing on social media, astroturfing on social media, whatever the attack is, then they use the Manila Times, which is a newspaper that used to be credible. Now it is the chairman emeritus is in charge of international public relations for President Duterte. And then top down, whatever is seated there, President Duterte or a top government official will say, and you are just crushed in there. The oust Duterte plot, they announced from the podium of the most powerful man in our country, they named journalists, including me, including um, Vera Files, which is another fact-checking partner of Facebook, Ellen Tordesillas, uh, uh, Sheila Coronel, the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. She's no longer in the Philippines. She's a dean in Columbia University in New York. She's named uh, a whole group of people, lots of mistakes, People kind of laughed it out, but here's what happened to some of the people who were on the list. They, they were afraid for their lives uh, because in the narco list, the drug list that the president uh, had first posted publicly, people wound up dead. Um, in our case, we faced the real challenges already. The law has been weaponized against us. And I thought that this was so ludicrous, the public wouldn't stand for it. But the danger is that it sets the stage if they use national security laws. Every charge I have is bailable. Uh, and if I face a charge that is non-bailable. Well, did I mention that I pay more in bail than Imelda no, Marcos? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you should say half a million pesos, right? I mean, that's just for one. So there are eight different charges there, this many, eight different charges. And for every single charge and every court, it's slightly different. There are courts I pay 4,000 pesos per charge. And then one court that actually just told us at noon, the day before I was supposed to leave for Hong Kong, that they were charging me 500,000 pesos to be for a travel bond. Imelda Marcos's bail was 450,000 pesos. Total, Rappler, because they also, in the criminal charges, they also charged my entire board in 2015. We have paid almost 3 million pesos. It's 50 to 1. Who's a good math person? Not journalists. <laughs> um, uh, 50, so three, almost 3 million pesos just to be here. Uh, to be able to be free. So 2018 was all about anger management for me. Wow. <laughs> I was going to ask, of course, how is um, the um, website funded? Where do you get the money from? Do you need to do a paywall? Is it uh, your uh, readers, your supporters? I mean, yeah. so I'll the start network as well. I will start with the headline, which I'm really, really proud of, and I just sent off the report to our board, the first quarter report. Um, because we were under attack and because people can make calls to make your advertisers go away, right? Um, by February last year, we realized that we had to pivot away from advertising as a business model. This quarter, we are 250% up in terms of revenues, contracts closed versus last quarter, uh, last year. So um, we, were, we pivoted the business model, um, but let me go backwards in time. Uh, we're a startup. Uh, we started with a $2 million seed fund. This is something we ourselves had put in. Like I told you, there were four or five of us above 40, right? And 
we had we we did okay. So we started with two million dollars. Our burn rate is very low. It was less than two hundred thousand dollars a month, right? If we were set up in New York, that would be impossible. And we had really good people come in, and we developed workflow processes like. Before I could get a tripod like that, we actually had a metal worker in the Philippines create a case for their our cell phones and then do the tripod before it was ready-made. Right? Now that it's ready-made, it's just so easy. Um, so that was our first one. Then I did a Series A. If you're a startup, you know you have Seed, Series A, Series B, Series C. Series A. I've only gone as far as Series A, and we hit break-even when I needed to hit break-even. Our, my target was in five years' time. But we also hit our first positive net income uh, a month before President Duterte was elected. And then the attacks began. So our, our Series A was Omidyar Network and, uh, and North Base Media. And they were not, the reason I didn't raise the money from the Philippines is that political harassment is much easier with a Filipino company. And I wanted to be independent. And free? and free, it's still free, but here's, uh, so the la last part is, we pivoted the business model to do the things that we had discovered in discovering disinformation networks, right? Think about it on social media. We live on social media. I, unlike the West, I do not want Facebook to go away. I want Facebook to clean up, you know, because it, if you live in a country where corruption is endemic, law enforcement is weak, institutions of governance are weak, you want this enabling bottom-up, Hong Kong. You know, you, you saw a lot of this stuff, but at the same time, the gatekeeping powers have to be better. So what we did, we used social media, and the very things, because we live on social media, we used social network analysis, we created databases, uh, we were able to map information operations. And mapping that, that's only the first step in being able to then deploy it, say, companies in crisis. You're looking at narrative strategies, distribution strategies. Every company around the world is going to have to deal with the impact of both the internet and social media. Yeah, interesting. Can you... Um, Sorry, I'm geeky in this, so you have no, to no, stop it's me. It's okay, yeah, 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 it's fine. <laughs> we, we still, I, I keep an eye. Um, can you tell us about your audience? You, you mainly publish in English, but a little bit of Tagalog as well. Are you talking to the elite, educated Filipinos, or are you trying to reach everyone? Uh, 100 million people in the Philippines, median age is 23 years old. Our audience is primarily 18 to 34 years old in Rappler, part of the reason I think we were targeted by the government as well. Uh, we opened a bureau in Jakarta in 2014. Again, 250, 260 million people, median age 23, 24. What we were after is how do we give power to the youth who actually have time to organize? The pitch for Rappler was never about journalism. Journalism was a given. Good journalism is a given. The pitch was, my elevator pitch, we build communities of action. So journalism, on the Venn diagram, this is journalism, this is technology, and this is community. We embraced our community. It made us vulnerable when social media was weaponized in 2016. And you can peg it to that. And, you know, why the Philippines? Because uh, J January 2019, Hootsuite, We Are Social came out with numbers. Filipinos spend the most time on the internet and Filipinos spend the most time on social media, despite the speed of our internet. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about precisely your supporters uh, elsewhere than uh, in the Philippines? Your profile is completely international now. You're off uh, to Colombia for the commencement, sorry, commencement speech, right? You're giving yeah. the journalism award. Yeah, you know, yes. I would give all the awards back to have a fully functioning democracy. I mean, it's... But, but can you tell us a little bit about the people who help you from outside? You mentioned the Pierre sure. Media uh, Network. Uh, do you have famous lawyers, um, famous tycoons who help you, support you? <coughs> in yes. America and elsewhere in Europe? So I would say yes you and no, Macron, right? Macron, because, right? well, Macron, I love Macron. But ah. it was mostly because, I, I know not everybody does, <laughs> but um, he's so, 
we spent an hour and a half. There's it, RSF uh, created this Information and Democracy Commission, right? And this is a, an effort to kind of create a global group. It was 25 people who come from all different parts of the world, Nobel laureates, economists, lawyers, journalists, activists, uh, tech. Uh, there's a whole new world order, right? Your question is difficult because if you're listening to it, we are Filipino owned. We are Filipino operated. It's a big thing. It's what the government is using. And the government is laying a narrative that foreign funding is trying to take down the Duterte administration. It's very Putin-esque. Uh, I think we should all look for the dictator's playbook they're all sharing. Um, and including Trump. Anyway, uh, so what are we after? I think technology is so important. If you look at it, how come authoritarian populist leaders have taken office in numerous countries around the world? Uh, propaganda has always been there, everyone says that, but we've never had technology push in quite the same way. A lie told a million times is fact. That's a reality and it's shifted elections in many different countries around the world. Tech is the accelerant. So when I, what I was sup supreme, what I was extremely fascinated by is how do we use that tech for good? And that was why I went around the world truly searching for an answer. And this is a time when I have a lot at risk. My personal safety, my company, the people who work for us. I think in the short term, look, the solution is only with the social media platforms. Because the problem with social media platforms, American social media platforms, is they were the accelerant for the fire that has engulfed the world, right? Anyway, I'm sorry I, I took that You didn't all reply through. to my question at all, but you moved to the ah, next one. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, no, sorry. Because uh, your question was really about, it's the international support was always stemmed from technology. I wanted you to revisit... Um, you uh, encounter with... Oh, oh my gosh, I know we... <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, I'm dense. Uh, no, no, George no. and Amal Clooney, they really yeah. are as smart and as beautiful and handsome as you thought they were. <laughs> George and Amal Clooney. So, uh, two weeks ago, maybe, uh, the launch of Trial Watch, and again, old power and new power. Uh, they at, we met for 30 minutes in a room uh, at Columbia University where they had launched it. And it's really funny because the couple shooed out everyone. And here I am in this room. Across from me, Amal sits down immediately and says, this is what's going to happen. So a lot of this stuff is off the record. No. <laughs> this, sure. is, this is what's going to happen. And then she, she, uh, she started like just going from macro to micro. And then she talked about, this part I can talk about because it's already out. She talked about what it's like to negotiate with the Myanmar government. Right? And remember, the Supreme Court in Myanmar, oh, not Supreme Court, whatever, they had just lost an appeal. And, and that, that was the day before, and, and uh, Amal was saying that they would be released soon. And they were. So, of course, I wrote her a congratulatory note. But while Amal was talking, and I was frantically taking notes, what was George Clooney doing? Well, there was an espresso machine in the office. <laughs> You're laughing. He made us coffee. Literally, coffee by George Clooney. I wanted to take out my phone and, you know, <laughs> snap a photo. Um, but, and, then, and then he sat down and I realized, you know, you forget George Clooney's father is a journalist. And he knew the details of what we do. And he knew the stresses and the dangers and concerns for security. That, uh, that he's gone through. I think he went to Darfur and he really took this. The couple is incredible and I hope, you know, since then, George Clooney has actually helped bring us attention in, in the strangest of places, like the launch of uh, his new movie, I think, or series. Um, so I think that's the other thing we need to learn, right? Uh, there are these substantive people who are our allies and we are their allies and we need to bring them in because our biggest battle in our generation is the battle for truth. And journalists are at the front line of that and we are under attack. Mm. Thanks for that and, and uh, we're inviting them as well. Uh, we, we I have their email. 
<laughs> a few a few years ago with the Myanmar story, we asked actually Amal Clooney, but we're much even happier to have you to speak at the Human Rights Press uh, Press Very Award. No. Now we let's move back to the global uh, new challenges for journalism, the digital revolution that you uh, mentioned, and the impact of social media. How do you find this new landscape? Is it exciting? Is it scary? I, I, it's exciting and scary, and the more we move into it, uh, actually this is part of what keeps me going. Um, to this year, we're now building the tech platform that I wanted to build in 2017. Uh, I think that the technology, both are the bane of our existence and our salvation is technology. And if you're not looking at it closely, you must, because you cannot leave the technology in the hands of coders and social media platforms. Uh, and that's part of the reason that the solution globally is actually a mix, right? And there's this one weekend in Berlin where Madeleine Albright, uh, the Republican former national security advisor, she always works with, uh, and then the former justice minister in Israel, the, it was old power along with new power. Facebook, Microsoft, uh, there were two of us who were journalists. There were like 10 of us around the table. The Atlantic Council put this together. 10.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., we just sat around the table and threshed it out. And I learned that old power has absolutely no idea about what new power does, and new power had absolutely no idea about the systems they had completely destroyed not even disrupted, right? And so this is why RSF, you know, Information and Democracy Commission, Madeleine Albright knew from her experience what the signs were of, of, of increasing fascism. In her book, she writes about it. If you haven't read Timothy Snyder's book on tyranny, you must. It was published in 2017. It's all of the, it's like this thick, and it's 20 lessons from the 20th century. So that weekend was all about Madeleine Albright telling the tech people, this is what's happening, and the tech people saying, but that's not our fault. But yes, it is, <laughs> you know? Wow. So, yeah. so it's, it's, uh, that's what we need to do, and I think we need to be as fluent in tech speak as we are in journalism. Yeah, well, good lesson. I'm useless with tech, so. Uh, you will. <laughs> it's not that. No, no, I mean, not, not that, but, but uh, certainly, yeah, very far from uh, what you do. We'll quickly um, talk about the Philippines uh, and the, the elections that have just uh, taken place, and then uh, we'll open the floor to questions. Uh, can you give us your reaction? I told you already about the astroturfing on social media bottom up, right? And then I traditional mean, maybe media. Maybe we should just uh, go to the elections? No, no, no. Yeah. Re recap. What the oh, result, yeah, sure, which sure. is probably not what you would have hoped for. For the first time since 1938, no opposition candidate for senator has won a seat. And the, the official count is still ongoing, but the partial unofficial count is over 98% now. Um, in favor of Duterte. So, so it is overwhelmingly in favor. It is a mandate. It's a referendum on his popularity on the senatorial level. In the local elections, where a lot of violence ten tended to happen in the past, there have been some changes. But, you know, I actually say the more things change, the more they stay the same. Filipinos, like everyone else around the world, wanted change. But it seems like what we did is we put in place a new group of faces who are bringing on their own allies. In the Marcos days, we called them cronies. The Marcoses are back in full force. They won in every single... Um, every single election. So what does this mean? We have a very, very strong president. It shows he is very popular, about, you know, not beyond what where President Benigno Aquino was in this point in his career. He's three years into a six-year term, only one. And the only way he can stay in office is if term limits are lifted, meaning if our constitution is changed. Um, but uh, we have presidential elections in three years. So. Uh, this means two things for us, I think. Hopefully he's magnanimous in victory. I hope. Um, but if he's not, and they want to consolidate power even more, then uh, I think journalists, activists, we need to collaborate far more actively if we want to protect the rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution. The biggest problem, of course, is if our Constitution is changed, 
the Senate was the one independent body that was pushing back against policies that had been pushed by, the, by our House of Representatives, a death penalty, for example, uh, a new constitution. If we have a new constitution, it's not just a shift in the form. If we no longer have freedom of the press, then okay, not a problem, I guess. You know, the, the biggest, I guess I walk out of the results as I'm looking at them. I, I wonder about our values. Uh, you know, do we really, have we just given an okay to a brutal war on drugs that has, according to the United Nations, killed more than 27,000 Filipinos since July of 2016? July of 2016, that's a huge number. Have we said we want our kids to become sexist or misogynists because these are the things that are going, that our president does, you know? So I, we were talking last night about the power of a leader, what Jacinda did in New Zealand, right? What Duterte is doing in the Philippines, what Trump is doing in the United States. Leaders have tremendous power. But there must be something good about his presidency for him to be so popular. So do you recognize any quality to him? I was one of the ones who did an interview that humanized him in October of 2015. Uh, he's, he was charming. He was, look, he admitted to me on camera he killed three people. No one had ever done that before. So, and that clip has been used by John Oliver. You know, um, so what is good about Duterte? Just like Trump, uh, our mass base will say he's one of us. We're having a beer with him. He says the things. And then for the younger guys who are his supporters, I'll always ask, you know, how could you, you are a progressive male. You're a progressive young man. How could you do that? And, he, and then the response is, you know, it's like, the older generation has different values. It's like, you know, talking to your grandfather. You just don't, you ignore that part. So it's selective, right? It's willful ignorance, I think, is what, what, what we're looking at. You cherry pick the things you like. The good thing he's done in 2016, and I'll say this for 2016, I think that the level of engagement, and I don't just mean social media engagement, there were many, many more Filipinos who went to the polls. And you could see it in the voter turnout. In, uh, in 2013, the voter turnout was like 74%. And in 2016, it went up to 81%, right? Voter turnout now is roughly 72% for the 2019 elections. These are huge numbers yeah. for a Western democracy. Absolutely. But mm. for the Philippines, you can see, right? Now, the question goes back to, um, I think there's a lot of policies of governance that that social media, that Filipinos are not touching anymore because like the US, you know, it's Trump's tweet that takes up the oxygen. It, we're not discussing critical things that need to be part of a functioning democracy. Uh, and we have slipped further and further. It's death by a thousand cuts of our democracy. Great. Well, it's fascinating. Uh, it feels all the more uh, a privilege to uh, to have you here. Uh, no, we have, to, you we have to write books so about this time period, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and we still have 20, 15 to 20 minutes for questions. So please raise your hands, identify yourself, and, and put your question to, uh, to Maria. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, hi, my name is Holly, and I'm from the Philippines. Um, with the recent election, there was so, mu so much report on um, alleged uh, cheating. You know, there were glitches and the uh, you know, sudden seven-hour blackout of um, That's correct. Uh, yes. transparency, um, vote buying, massive vote buying. If um, it's true and if it didn't happen, do you think the result would have been different and there would be more um, you know, opposition in the Senate now? So, you know, I actually, we had somebody inside the server room, and if you go on Rappler, we act, she actually wrote exactly about it. From the actual processes, uh, there wasn't anything wrong, uh, except for the fact that they used outdated code, and, you know, the guy who really, the commissioner who really knew the IT part had recently resigned. So it was scampering for that. Is there enough to say there was cheating? I think the investigation has to move forward. If you'll read on Rappler, we actually, uh, we actually say Kamalek at that point did its job. Uh, 
and Kamalek asked us for the for for our own data and our our processes. So premature. But here's the other thing Kamalek did say. They said that the number of vote buying incidents that were reported were more than double what they used to be, and there are reasons for that. President Duterte actually said it's okay to go. It's mu it's much more blatant. You know, he he's it's okay setting. To what? It's okay to. It's okay cheat. to not just offer someone to buy their votes, but to accept the money uh, that is being offered to you. Because he said, there, as long as there's poverty, you know, you're going to need the monies. But <laughs> everything is a new normal with President Duterte. He's a, president, he's a leader who said, I will appoint you because you did something for me. Quid pro quo, in, in Tagalog, utang na loob, debt from within, right? And he's admitted this publicly, act, in the same way he admitted he had infidelities. It's actually a, a very interesting way of managing the public. Um, so by saying that it's okay to have vote buying, go ahead, if you're a candidate, go buy people's votes. He didn't say that as a direct quote, but you know that's exactly what he said. What happened was everything was more blatant. People were told to go to the basketball courts so that you can then get the money that you that you will get to, in order to vote for the candidate that they want. And, uh, and this had never really been done before. The, the kind of use of the police as a, an intimidation tactic. Again, I think what President Duterte, what we saw in these elections was the normalization of local electoral politics, tactics from Davao City pushed to a national stage. So now it's okay to do that. What I'm hoping is that the man, instead of the man shifting to the position, is that he grows into the position so he could actually become a leader of the entire Philippines and move into the international stage, right? See, I can hope. <laughs> Next question. Yes, here we have two, the gentleman and then the lady there. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Patricia. I'm also from the Philippines, and um, I used to be yeah, I used to be a journalist on GMA News TV in the early days. Um, on the elections again, when it was still during campaign season, there the activists were very hopeful that social media would be able to get some opposition onto the slate, and we did not see that pan out. So. I mean, what do you say about that? Like, you know, the activists were really mobilizing on Twitter, on Facebook, and really trying their best, I guess. But still, it didn't translate into the votes that were needed to get someone on there. Is it just a failure of our values or something else? I'm so glad you asked that. But no, so primarily, and again, I'll look at the Democratic Party, right? Information operations, information warfare, there's another phrase we use, patriotic trolling. Online, state-sponsored hate that is meant to pound you, the target, to silence, right? It incites hate against you. So Patricia, for example, if you're my target, I'm gonna tell everyone in this room, I'll pay them and I will go attack her exactly at this time and you will get all the attacks simultaneously and you'll, I'll tell you the impact on me of 90 hate messages per hour. You sit there and you go, what did I do wrong? You don't know that it's manufactured. You don't know that it's fake. So that's the first step, is that governments globally, are more authoritarian style governments, are using patriotic trolling against their citizens. They, the social media platforms have enabled this. The second part is, if you actually have values, are you going to want to use anger, anger and hate against your own citizens. It's, it's a tactic that, is, that destroys society. So we don't see the Democratic Party, I mean, you see a lot more nastiness online. But what we saw in the Philippines, the data that we have shows you that the Facebook campaigns, it's overwhelmingly pro-Duterte and their accounts, whether they're real or fake, or whether they're part of the information ne disinformation networks, they've controlled mainstream now on social media. On Twitter, yes, I also saw a ramp up, right? And it was really wonderful, but guess what? There are only 7% of Filipinos on Twitter. So it was never effective to begin with. And the biggest problem here is really, frankly, the opposition needs to look at themselves in the eye. 
uh, they never declared a crisis point where all of them actually came together. Kanya-kanya pa siya eh, di ba? Kanya-kanya means they were still fragmented. It's like, if you want your power base, you don't want to join with mine. The pettiness of politics. They treated these elections like it was politics as usual instead of becoming leaders. These are the, the, the politicians who have mass pull. And I would put in there Mar Rojas, Grace Poe, people who ran for president who didn't pull anyone else. They didn't act like leaders. They got themselves elected in Grace Poe's case. In Mar Rojas, he got derailed not just because of his performance, but because of the black operations against him. Uh, we saw those attacks and they were coordinated. The last part is, I feel sorry for the eight candidates who threw their heart into the game. They called it Ocho Derecho. They threw themselves into it. Chel Jokno, hashtag woke lodo. They even had a hashtag. But they didn't have enough. Not enough resources, not enough, uh, not enough popularity to begin with. I'll shut up, sorry. Next question, thank you. You know, we're seeing uh, a talk, you know, kind of autocratic governments uh, rise around the world. Right? So that's India. something that's happening. Yes. But, 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 they're being democratically elected. So, you yourself said that in the Philippines there was no uh, concern about voting. You know, India has an election. I'm, I'm from India. There must be some things that he's doing right. So, if 60 percent is okay and 40 percent is not okay, you kind of live with that because, you know, life's tough anyway, right? That's true of India. That's true of uh, the people who supported Trump. So, I from where you are, and you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're the conscience keeper of, of, uh, of the government, what do you think it is? How do you read this? I'll pull back and I'll pull into India, right? I think as the world has become more complex, we want someone to have the solutions for us. That, and that kind of emotion started with the 2014 elections of Modi in India. In Indonesia, we almost saw Prabowo, the son-in-law of former President Suharto, elected into office. Ironically, it was social media that nudged him out. Uh, in the Philippines, we're seeing it's, it's a nostalgia for the past. The Marcos has used it very well, along with kind of like a, 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 a historical revisionist approach on social media. Um, so there's that. And then you put social media platforms into play. I don't think it's a coincidence that in 2015, when every news group around the world was invited by Facebook to join Instant Articles, which news groups here didn't join, right? All of us went into Instant Articles. But Instant Articles, Facebook then became the world's largest distributor of news. But the algorithms that governed the distribution and the virality of information didn't change. So, you know, the information operations that were started, and you can look at the Mueller report here, you can see that there were information operations there, it was connected to Russian disinformation, and that that is global. We found uh, in January of 2019 this year, the connection between the Philippines disinformation ecosystem and the IRA and that global propaganda network, right? One guy who is a, a, both, he is an expert for RT and Sputnik, expert in quotes, and also quoted all the time on Iranian television, is now has popped up on Manila Times through a website in the Philippines. I only say that because I think that we have the human tendency. Social media has brought out the worst of human nature, anger, fear, hate. It's also fed into our wishes as people for a far less complex world and instant solutions. And who gives that? Populist leaders, authoritarian style leaders, Nazis were elected into office, right? This is a gradual transformation. Authoritarian dictators, they don't walk into, well, some do, but, you know, in many countries around the world, they were elected. So that's why I was suggesting on tyranny. I reread it again. Uh, it's, it's set for today, right? It looks at history. It's a great cheat sheet for how we can look at. And then the last thing I'll say is about the technology itself. When you're on social media, you're actually addicted. You're mildly addicted. You're, you have increased enhanced levels of, of hormones like dopamine, 
oxytocin. These things change and rewire your brains. We don't acknowledge that, right? Um, so I, I'm saying that the manipulation of people globally is not just because of geopolitical power uh, that is meant to, to, to get power. It is also in the technology. It's like it's being addicted to it slightly. And, and so I think the first group that needs to do something about it are the social media platforms. Eric? Yeah, Eric Wisher from AFP. Um, I mean, you were one of the people of the year in Time Magazine. I saw you in Times Square and on Christmas Eve. You seem to have this dual role now. I mean, on one hand, I think you said yesterday, two weeks of the year you're on the road, right? I think you're going to the States after this. Um, so on one hand, you become this international icon. Of and I don't use that word lightly of press freedom. You have. I mean, That's anybody, right. well, you were right up there with Jamal Khashoggi and... Uh, He's dead. Yes. He's brutally murdered, yes. right? But, but, and the uh, writers, journalists from Myanmar who were released. Free. Yeah. And the, the journalists who were killed in the United States. So you're now caught up in this. You're, at the same time, you've got a news organization to run back home. When you're waking up in the morning, who is Maria Ressa now in your head? Are you this international global fighter for human rights? Or do you always have this thing in the back of your head, I've got to get back, back to the newsroom? How do, you, how do you place yourself in all that? I'm a traditional, I'm, I grew up when we grew up, right? And so there's a part of me when you call me, when our flyer went out for this, I'm uncomfortable. I'm very uncomfortable with, because we grew up with the tenants that were reporting the news. I do not want to be the news. It is not by choice. But at the same time, I almost felt that the handcuffs came off when, it, when my rights were violated. And that gave me a first person place where I can speak. And I didn't want the fact that I was a journalist to get in the way of my own voice a tough thing to go to, to struggle with and, and we still are right what is Rappler is Rappler one of the first choices we made early on is we have a civic engagement arm move ph we started on Facebook in the end of 2011 with move ph we almost named ourselves move ph except the traditional folks felt it was too activist so at a time when we are battling for truth do we embrace that we are fighting for truth I, I have, by no choice of mine, I couldn't. But all of this stuff, I mean, to be honest, I, there's so many things I want to write and so many things I want to do, but the reason I speak and the reason I go to this is because we are under attack. And the only defense that I have, we jumped off the cliff, right? And the only, it's like a faith that a parachute will open and you guys provide that. Journalists, only weapon is shine the light. We've been doing it in Rappler. It's not enough. See? And the only thing that gets me emotional is knowing that um, it's our next generation. You know, uh, that's why uh, every time I get tired, because <laughs> it's tiring. Yeah. Um, Every time I get tired, I look at our reporters, and I know that we're building the future. And I know that they have the courage, that they have far more energy. Um, this is an important time for us as journalists. We can't buckle, because if we do, it's your kids that will feel it. Thank you very much. And, and possibly to follow up a little bit on this and, and to close, because uh, we're uh, reaching uh, to 2 o'clock, and we like to be, uh, to be on time. Um, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting what I was going to say. <laughs> My God. Um, no, about you being this, uh, yes, I know, uh, being this uh, icon of uh, press freedom, does it help you somehow, the international pressure, uh, the inter I mean, the international support that you get, and does the President uh, Duterte feel that? And, uh, yeah, how does he react to it? I mean... I think the reason I'm not in prison is because of what of the stories that continue to come out. Um, look, in over a year and a half of cases and motions and everything that we've filed, we've never won one. A actually, we won one. 
the National Bureau of Investigation threw out the case for cyber libel because he said that the law hadn't been enacted yet like a normal person would. That guy was overruled a week later and he's been reassigned to Timbuktu. I feel really sorry for him. That's the cautionary tale. Um, icon is a weird word. I don't, I, all I do, and I think what Rappler does on a daily basis is we look at the stories, we tell it like it is. And then for me, it's, I almost feel like I'm under two oceans of water because trying to run Rappler, trying to fight the government, trying to defend ourselves in the cases, and trying to figure out what the future is going to look like. It's daunting and it's exciting. Right? I guess that's where, it leads. so what we do, what I do, one foot in front of the other every day. And then I wake up and when I have coffee, it's tremendous energy. Uh, <laughs> but international support helps. Oh my gosh, thank you for, thank you. You know, um, I say this, wh when Time Magazine named, named me one of the guardians, they didn't tell me. Uh, I found out on Twitter. And when I found out, I thought it was, I wasn't sure if it was real, so I sent it to our social media team to verify that it was actually not fake news. Um, and then when I realized that I was the, one of the persons of the year, my stomach sank first because I wasn't sure whether it was positive or negative, right? Uh, because there's a part of you that wants to duck. Who doesn't want to duck, mm. right? But I also know the fact that we did not duck helped lift this and gave more space. So at a certain point, that, that knot in my stomach lasted for like a few seconds, and then I just realized, it's here. I'm gonna make the best of this, and thank you, time, right? Thank you for the stories. Please, in the Philippines, we can win this battle. We can protect our democracy, and I hope that we're just, you know, I hope that that gives strength to other people around the world who are also fighting the same battle. Well, immense thank you to you, uh, Maria, to, for being with us at uh, the FCC. And I have a very small token of appreciation uh, for you. And please, a big round of applause for Maria Ressa. <laughs> <laughs>